few more friends joining us here, so why don't we get settled. My name is Jay Hine. I'm president of the Sagamore Institute. What a delight it is to welcome you to our building um, and to welcome you to Mr. Levy's neighborhood. <laughs> so, Louis Levy was a printer from southern Indiana, from Madison. You may know his story. Um, if you don't, I want to give it a, a bit of a framing because it's, uh, it's an inspiration we're using for today. Louis Levy uh, was a printer on the old Nordstrom's building. For those of you that remember where it was in the mall, you'll see Levy Brothers scrolled across the, the top of that building. That whole block was the Levy Brothers print shop. He commissioned this mansion to be built in 1905. I don't know how long it took to, to build it. I've got a couple few years. And he had a remarkable set of friends, and that's who we're going to celebrate today. As a matter of fact, if you look at the time period between the Civil War and our state centennial in 1916, we had arguably the best 50 years of leadership um, in our state's history. Um, you know many of these names individually. Um, I suspect you haven't spent a lot of time thinking collectively about who they were. It may be a good parlor game, too, to see if the last 50 were better than that 50, because I think it'd be a really terrific competition, and we have a number of those leaders in the, in the room today. But when you, think of, when you look at this game day program, we refer to it as, um, I am offering lunch for any one of you who can read this program, start to finish, and not say at least five times, I had no idea. Uh, because it is stunning. Um, as a matter of fact, the talent was so extraordinary and rich, we had to put them in categories, um, from statesmen to industrialists to arts and letters. Um, just a remarkable assembly of talent. And I wanted us, as um, part of the third annual Indiana Conference on Citizenship, to contemplate um, who they were and, and how, as citizens, they, they helped build the cities they lived in and, and the state that, that we enjoy. We stand on their shoulders, of course. Maybe also to contemplate what it meant to be contemporaries. So Mr. Levy's neighborhood had a president and a vice president, and, and these remarkable literary giants. Um, and it's probably tempting to look back at them with a, a halo um, and to see their enormous contribution, as we should. But they probably had a few rivalries among them. Um, they probably had a few stumbles that are also good for, for us to contemplate as well and to be inspired by uh, as we think about the challenges that are nation faces, the, the uncivil discourse uh, that, is, that is too often a, uh, a part of what we see on the news or in the public square. Indiana has a lot to offer, and it always has, um, to enliven the debate, to educate the debate, um, but also just to roll up sleeves and to build better neighborhoods and to create jobs and to build a better society. It's a big reason why the Sagamore Institute exists. I want to acknowledge at least three board members. I, I see Doug Wilson, our chairman, and Dave Mollendorf, our vice chairman, Chris Lowry, uh, board member, if I'm missing any, please raise your hand. We have many dignitaries among us, too many for me to work through a list. You all are. That's the point of this gathering. Um, the American founders believed that citizens would be at the center of the American experiment. And when Benjamin Franklin left Constitutional Hall, and, and uh, the story is true, and the woman asked him, what kind of government did you give us? And he said, a republic, if you keep it, ma'am, um, is our assignment today. What does it mean to keep the republic, to en enrich the republic? Well, we know it means a couple of things, at least. You need to be really well educated on the issues of the day, but also the duties of citizenship. Um, and we need to be highly engaged in the affairs of society. We don't just elect those who um, build and fix. Um, we, we perform those duties ourselves. Always have, um, and it's a, the American idea um, centers on it. Um, but that has to be renewed generation after generation. And again, that's why we're gathered here. We want to celebrate the citizens of the, the Civil War era leading through the, the birth of the, the last century. Um, we're going to hear three phenomenal speakers um, who I apologize are going to have tough acts to follow because some of you have already heard from Abraham Lincoln and Benjamin uh, Harrison and Railroad Dan may have been the best of the bunch in terms of entertainment. And so the bar has been set high, um, but you, these gentlemen will not disappoint. We're going to treat it a bit like a, um, Benjamin Harrison's front porch. Um, I'm just going to in introduce them very briefly because you already know them. Um, I'm sure their bios are in the, the program, but I'm just going to uh, introduce them each sort of at a top line narrative now, and then they can just um, follow each other. First, Charlie Hyde, then John Lux, and or, I'm sorry, um, Mike Murphy, and then John Mutz can be our anchor here. Um, Charlie Hyde is president and CEO 
of the Benjamin Harrison home, the terrific mission to become the most civically engaged presidential site uh, in America. I hope you all participate in their mission. Um, Mike Murphy wrote a terrific book he's going to tell you about, which um, will uh, give us a peek into the Civil War era on a, um, how we were a state divided in many respects and what it took for us to persevere internally just as our our uh, uh, national story was, was working out this, this great struggle. And John Mutz is going to remind us that the arts are just as important as the affairs of, of state. Um, so we're really privileged to have each of them with us today, and indeed, each of you. Thank you very much. Well, special thanks to the Sagamore Institute and to Jay for inviting me today. I'm honored to speak to such a distinguished audience, and I'm pleased to see so many friends and familiar faces. That said, I'm, I'm here today for three reasons. One, to share a story about a singular individual who called Indiana his home and is one of the state's preeminent citizens over the past two centuries. Two, to give perspective on what value his story brings to Indiana's third century. And three, to ask each of you, again, to answer the call of service as fellow citizens for this great state. As citizens of this great state, you're better qualified to help address the challenges that we face today. So as many of you know, Benjamin Harrison was a leader steeped in the importance of public service and civic virtue. He asserted that an American citizen could not be a good citizen who did not have a hope in his heart. So an American citizen could not be a good citizen who did not have a hope in his heart. Benjamin Harrison is the only president elected from Indiana. And while he died at the turning of the last century in 1901, his influence has persisted in ways large and small. His life, much like his legacy, was about looking back and looking forward. The Harrison family record of personal devotion to the United States is matched by few other families throughout our country's history. His great-grandfather was a governor of Virginia and a signer of the Declaration of Independence. His grandfather was a governor of the Indiana Territory and ninth president of the United States. His father served in the Ohio legislature. But in spite of this illustrious lineage, he was no son of privilege. He worked hard to become a preeminent lawyer, answering Lincoln's call for citizen soldiers, and distinguished himself as a Civil War hero. He's remembered primarily today as a conscientious president an eminent 19th century statesman. But much can be lost in the retelling of history. The bold and the brash are often drawing more interest than the stalwart and strategic. And here, perhaps, is an opportunity to revisit Harrison's legacy and his larger influence on our country and our community. Renowned Indiana historian James Madison recently asserted that Harrison's administration is considered to be among the most activist and reform-minded of the 19th century. As 23rd President of the United States, Benjamin Harrison set aside 13 million acres of federal land for conservation, advocated for African-American voting rights, celebrated the centennial, initiated the modern Two Ocean Navy for national defense, secured pensions for Civil War veterans and their widows, hired the first woman on the White House staff, and called for and signed the Sherman Antitrust Act. He presided over the first billion dollar federal budget, first adopted the Pledge of Allegiance, admitted six states to the Union, and left an indelible mark on American culture. While many of his reform efforts were stymied by an intractable Congress, he is increasingly understood as one of the first modern presidents for a strong ethical stance and foresight. His legacy of leadership has been carried forward to today and has helped shape our local and national consciousness in ways that are positive, compelling, but often unacknowledged. He wasn't a Hoosier by birth, but by choice. And Indiana could not have had any president more closely aligned with its values. In typical Hoosier fashion, he diligently went about his work, doing what was right for the right reasons, and never seeking undue recognition. He spent his childhood and youth on his grandfather William Henry Harrison's Ohio farm. During college, he met, courted, and married the charming, vivacious, and exceptional for her day, college-educated Carolyn Scott in 1853. They considered moving to Chicago or staying in Cincinnati, but in 1854, the couple decided their prospects would be best in Indianapolis. A wise choice. 
Upon arrival here, Harrison found that establishing a law practice was much more difficult than he had anticipated. Harrison's long hours, hard work, and diligence paid off. He was elected to the position of city attorney in 1857 and in 1860 to Supreme Court reporter. By his own account, it was the last political office that he voluntarily sought. On July 1st, 1862, a full year after the bombardment of Fort Sumter, Indiana Governor Oliver P. Morton pledged to aid Lincoln's call for 300,000 new reinforcements. So when Harrison and a friend found themselves in the governor's office on business and were invited to speak privately afterwards, Morton shared the difficulty he was facing in meeting Indiana's quota of troops. After a pronounced pause, Harrison offered, if I can be of any service, I will go. Understand the significance of the offer that Harrison was making. A young family, a thriving law practice, he held the coveted role of Supreme Court reporter. He was under no obligation to commit. Morton felt that it was asking too much to have Harrison go into the field of battle and offered that they could find somebody else to command the regiment if only Harrison might help raise it. Harrison, however, rejected the idea of asking men to join a regiment and go to war, but staying home himself. Harrison set about the arduous task that very day of raising a regiment. A thousand men from this community, from our community, more than likely a few of you have ancestors that answered his call to service. He was given a commission, a second lieutenant, and two weeks later, he was promoted to captain. While the regiment was completed, Governor Morton gave Harrison the commission of colonel. By August 8, 1862, the newly appointed Colonel Harrison had raised a thousand recruits for the 70th Indiana. He now had to turn these raw recruits into seasoned troops. By day, he marched and drilled his men, by night, long after taps had sounded, he studied and perfected himself in the tactics of war. Discipline would prove to be one of Harrison's most arduous tasks, but his reputation became that of a strong leader. He earned the respect of his men and did not leave them in battle, once even serving as their battlefield doctor under extenuating circumstances. The men learned that he stood by his word and was always concerned with their well-being. Harrison knew that they would have to be disciplined to survive battle. For Harrison's achievements and personal valor at the battles of Versaca and Peachtree Creek, leading his men from the front as they charged their Confederate opposition and overtook the artillery, he was promoted to Brigadier General. Returning to Indianapolis after his service in the Civil War, gratefully returning to Caroline and his two young children, reestablishing his law practice through a series of remarkable trials that made his reputation as a lawyer, first locally, then regionally, and then nationally. In 1881, Harrison was elected by the Indiana General Assembly to the U.S. Senate. His service over the next six years was exemplary, and his name began to circulate nationally as a serious contender for the presidency. Ironically, during this time, he lost an election for governor and re-election by the General Assembly to his Senate seat. But his larger qualities of integrity, intelligence, and as an orator par excellence had awakened national interest. The breadth and scope of Harrison's thinking was original and highly reform-minded for its day. He held tremendous sway as a person of great individual genius and forethought, and the cadence and incisiveness of his expression was bracing. He received a Republican nomination for the presidency in 1888 as a compromise candidate. Then, even as now, Indiana was a swing state, and Harrison was thought the best challenger uh, for incumbent Grover Cleveland. His campaign for the presidency in 1888 was innovative and on his own terms. He took the unusual step of conducting the campaign almost entirely from Indianapolis as a front porch campaign and gave 80 speeches extemporaneously to over 300,000 people. First from this very stoop of the front porch you'll see at 13th and Delaware Street today. Harrison did not secure the popular vote, but won the electoral vote. He took office without what our generation might call a clear mandate, but he had big plans that he intended to carry through. The first part of his term was a whirlwind of activity, accompanying expansion of the U.S. Navy, passing the Forest, Service, or Forest Reserve Act, protecting more than 13 million acres of natural resources, and championing African American rights. A member of Harrison's administration, a young Teddy Roosevelt, carried on this work and many other aspects of the Harrison legacy in his own administration. Harrison was a centennial president, inaugurated 100 years after George Washington, 
an occasion met with national celebration. At the festivities, he declared, and I quote, we have come into the serious but always inspiring <coughs> presence of Washington. He was the incarnation of duty, and he teaches us today this great lesson, that those who would associate their names with events that shall outlive a century only do so by high consecration to duty. Self-seeking has no public op op observance or anniversary. Harrison took this opportunity to encourage schools and public buildings to fly the American flag, and he endorsed the use of the Pledge of Allegiance, a tradition carried forward to today. He made significant efforts contributing to civil service reform and paid an electoral price for his scruples of making appointments based upon ability, not just as political favors. While receiving the nomination for the 1892 election, it was perhaps no large surprise for Harrison when Cleveland retook the presidency. He felt no loss to party, though, confiding that, quote, he felt like a man released from prison. I'm sure he was not the first or last president to feel that way. <laughs> Harrison's return to Indianapolis was bittersweet, but he was determined that Indianapolis would remain his home, saying, and I quote, I love this city. He occupied himself in resuming his successful law practice and guest lecturing at Stanford, first by bringing that institution to national attention. He was recognized by both parties as a potent political force and even rejected later requests to retake the White House. Benjamin Harrison lived in Indianapolis's golden age and did much to personally help it reach that level of attainment. It is no coincidence that his years in the White House coincided with the blossoming of this city. In April 1897, Benjamin Harrison made a speech to the Indianapolis Commercial Club. In the speech, Harrison boldly asserted that Indianapolis is no mean city carrying forward the crucial idea that a great community must invest in itself. He said, and I quote, but the ideal city must have other excellences. It must be a city where people diligently mind their own business and the public business and do both with a decent regard to the judgment and rights of other men. A site or a city whose citizens are brave and true and generous and who care for their own. A decade later, Indianapolis Mayor Charles Bookwalter echoed Harrison's No Mean City theme. His creative core, I am myself a citizen of No Mean City, was first chiseled into the cornerstone of City Hall, and ever since into the hearts of our community. Benjamin Harrison died unexpectedly in 1901 from complications from pneumonia after a short bout with influenza. His funeral was attended by President McKinley and dignitaries from across the country. James Whitcomb Riley wrote his eulogy and was buried in Crown Hill. Efforts were soon underway to build a memorial, culminating in 1908 with the dedication of a statue and monument led by Vice President Charles Fairbanks. On President Harrison's memorial statue just north of the Federal Building in downtown Indianapolis, he was remembered in this way, quote, his life exemplified the faith he taught, industry, fidelity, courage, sound statesmanship, and justice through law. As he himself eulogized another famed president, great lives do not go out, they go on. The Benjamin Harrison presidential site helps carry forward this great civic legacy today with 30,000 visitors annually, 19,000 of them Hoosier school children. With over 10,000 items in our collection, we are blessed with an abundance of cultural treasures. We know that preserving the home of the 23rd president is as much about saving a landmark and by extension, the greater memory of an age. But it's also about progress. Even as we're looking back, like Harrison, we're thinking forward. With new initiatives like Future Presidents of America Youth Leadership Camp to innovative special exhibits and thoughtful partnerships with organizations like the Sagamore Institute, the presidential site is pulsing with energy and expectation of great things to come. We recognize we all have the potential to do something extraordinary with this remarkable le legacy. It is both a reminder of the importance of service and begs for response. As each of us gives thought to our own service as citizens, and what will be our greatest legacy, is it sufficient to have done good work, to point only to the past, or might we find new ways, together, to help bring our state to another golden age, one that our children and children's children will look to for inspiration? As this is, after all, the Indiana Conference on Citizenship, I believe I speak for all of us here today in calling upon each of you as friends, as neighbors, as citizens, as leaders, as Sagamores, to redouble your efforts today in whatever way you can, in your business, in your place of worship, in the arts, in your schools, in cities, in counties, 
and in your state. We need your intelligence and your talents as much today as we ever have before. Great hearts, great lives. Make sure they do not go out, but go on. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Burke. A quick anecdote. Um, we were talking here a minute ago about rivalries. Um, Charlie mentioned Benjamin Harrison and Theodore Roosevelt. Well, during the Harrison administration, Roosevelt was a civil service commissioner. He made one mistake. He went after one of Benjamin Harrison's best friends in his civil service reform. He tried to prosecute the postmaster of uh, Indianapolis. And so for that sin, uh, Theodore Roosevelt was never invited to the White House during the Benjamin Harrison administration. <laughs> Um, we're here today to talk about citizenship, and I, I would hazard to guess that our view of citizenship today is very different than it was during the Civil War. Um, political people, and there's many here in the room, including my, one of my mentors in life, John Mutz, our former lieutenant governor, I think I saw former lieutenant governor Sue Ellsberg in here, and Tom Weatherwax and Peggy Walsh and many others. Um, political people um, come into the political business because they want to make a difference. And they each have their own um, perception of what being not only a good office holder, but a good public citizen means. And i give you a couple of examples here today um, of the different uh, perception, I think, of citizenship prior to the Civil War, during the Civil War. Um, and these were men, primarily white men, who thought of themselves as great leaders and great thinkers. Um, and one of them was related to a, a guy who served with Tom and I and Peggy, uh, Billy Bright. Billy Bright was from uh, North Vernon, Indiana, and his ancestor, uh, Jesse Bright, was the U.S. Senator from Indiana. At one time, the only U.S. Senator for several years because the legislature couldn't agree on a second senator. So he was the only senator, and he was from Madison, Indiana. Um, he was uh, an amazing guy, probably the, one of the two most powerful Democrats in the state at the time, a guy named Joseph Wright, who's probably the, the other powerful Democrat in the state, and they warred back and forth for uh, patronage control. Well, Jesse Bright, prior to Fort Sumter, several weeks before Fort Sumter, wrote a letter to Jefferson Davis and gave him advice on how to find, where to find cheap guns. And here he is, the United States Senator from Indiana. He was put on trial and thrown out of the U.S. Senate. I think the first U.S. Senator ever thrown out of the U.S. Senate. And he went on to live in, um, in Kentucky for the rest of his life. Um, James Cravens, who was a congressman from Scott County, the, the county I focus on, um, at one point wrote a letter to William English, another Hoosier that I'll talk about in a minute and has a big Indianapolis past as well, and he suggested three days before Fort Sumter that southern Indiana, southern Illinois, and southern Ohio be separated out into a new state that would be called Jackson, and it would join the Confederacy. And these guys thought that their role in, the, in, in citizenship was to oppose the, the continuing attempt to keep the rebellion, or to keep the, the Republic together. Uh, Daniel Voorhees, who is now he's known as the tall sycamore of the Wabash, the congressman from Terre Haute, who eventually became a U.S. Senator. He's, his office in August of 1863 in Terre Haute was raided by federal troops because he was thought to be a gun runner for the Confederates. They didn't find any guns, but they found a letter from a former U.S. Senator from New Jersey telling Voorhees how he could get a hold of 30,000 Garibaldi rifles that he could get to the Confederacy. And then William English himself, who grew up in the same county of the family I'll mention here in a minute, um, was a famous congressman, well known for his role in the, uh, the uh, Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Pact of 1854, and eventually moving here to Indianapolis to start the first national bank. In 1860, William English, who was known, by the way, as the slaveholder's ally, gave a speech to Congress in which he said, I'm paraphrasing obviously, in which he said, I will defend the South's right to a confederacy <coughs> with the ballot box or with the cartridge box, if necessary. Uh, Perry County and Orange County both had referenda and voted to join the Confederacy of Kentucky went. And we had draft officers killed, murdered on the um, Town Square in Nashville, Indiana. So those men, they thought they were good citizens. They thought that they were doing the right thing by opposing the, uh, the preservation of the republic, or at least opposing the war to preserve the republic. There was a saying back then among the Peace Democrats that the goal was the Constitution as it is, the Union as it was. 
And that was kind of their, their motto during the entire Civil War. Now, the book is titled, The Kimberlins Go to War, A Union Family in Copperhead Country. Now, who were the Kimberlins? The Kimberlins were an amazing family in their own right. They came from Hampshire County, Virginia, originally. And uh, one of the Kimberlins, the patriarch John Kimberlin, fought in the Revolutionary War in the, in, from Bedford, Pennsylvania. But after the Treaty of Grouseland, he brought his older sons down the Ohio River from Pennsylvania. And he bought 500 acres in what is now Scott County. Now, there was 135,000 acres set aside for veterans of George Rogers Clark's Revolutionary War Brigades. And uh, John Kimberlin, the patriarch, bought 500 acres from William Herod, who was a founder of Louisville. And that he, they became, the Kimberlin family, the first settlers of what is now Scott County. They fought at Tippecanoe with William Henry Harrison. They were involved in the Pigeon Roost Massacre in, um, in 1812, uh, south of Scottsburg. But by and large, they were a typical Hoosier farm family. They started off, they marched from Madison, Indiana, before there was a Madison, Indiana, by the way. Madison wasn't founded until 1808, and they came in 1805. They marched from the landing near Madison, Indiana, through the woods on a buffalo trace, and they plotted their 500 acres along a spring <coughs> along a creek that's now called Kimberlin Creek. They eventually established a tannery, an alehouse, a general store, and they were some of the leading citizens of, of Scott County for, for many years. Now, Scott County itself kind of swung back and forth. They started off as Jeffersonian Republicans, and then they kind of became Jacksonian Democrats, and then generally swung toward the Whigs, and then back in the 1850s, swung toward the Democrats again, while Madison remained stoutly Whig and Republican, and Clark County remained stoutly Democrat the whole time. That was the core of the, of the second con uh, congressional district. But as the call to war came in 1861, five brothers and cousins from the uh, Kimberlin family marched down the road, the Charlestown Road, and went off to war. They joined the 20, 23rd Indiana. In fact, the two units I primarily talked about in the book were the 23rd Indiana and 66. They didn't fight in Gettysburg. Um, they fought primarily in the Western Theater. Uh, the 66 fought at the Battle of Richmond. Uh, their first battle, they were completely wiped out at the Battle of Richmond, Kentucky. I won't get into all the battle history because you can always read about that. But, um, and then the 23rd Indiana fought in, in the Mississippi Campaign. Um, Fort Gibson, Raymond, Champion Hill, Vicksburg. Um, in fact, one of the Kimberlins was on the uh, first boat to uh, successfully run the batteries at Vicksburg in, in, uh, in early uh, May of 1863. Um, in fact, Peggy's from, Peggy's from uh, Mississippi, and uh, Peggy Welch, and I always remind her jokingly that the, fifth, the first flag to fly over the Capitol in Jackson, Mississippi, after we took the city, was the 55th Indiana Regimental Flag. So, um, so, so the Kimberlins um, eventually sent 33 men to fight for the Union in the Civil War. Ten of them died, um, and I have very fortunate to have access to dozens of letters to and from the battlefield that have been preserved until you know, to, today, to today. And this book is the first book to actually uh, uh, publish those letters. And they were held by a woman who is still alive, 91 years old, an English teacher from Scottsburg High School, who found the letters when she was a little girl in a barn along with a Civil War uniform. <laughs> Many years later, she went back. The uniform was gone, but the letters were still there, and she has kept them under her bed ever since. In fact, she was so distrusting of the outside world that I would have to go down on Sunday afternoons. I'd sit next to her. She'd read the old Victorian writing. I would transcribe them into my laptop, and then I would scan them quite selfishly in case uh, Thelma wasn't with us the next Sunday when I came back. Um, but it's an amazing family, and you have to consider that, that the... Um, the context of this family sending 33 people to war in the midst of what I call Copperhead country. Literally everything south of Indianapolis was Copperhead country. It's hard to understand right now. And I mentioned some of the views of our politicians. But marriages broke up. Churches broke up. There was a young uh, lady named Sarah Bovard Walshman, who was a 15-year-old living in Scott County at the time, who wrote a diary. Um, and it's, it's been published, and it's amazing. And my favorite quote from her diary is, on Thanksgiving of 1863, she says, Mama fixed the turkey for Thanksgiving, won't let anybody but success eat it. Success was a nickname for, for secessionists or copperheads. And so it, it, really did, did, it really did split families. Now one of the more amazing things we talk about in the book here is the Northwest Conspiracy. And some people know about it, some people don't know anything about it. 
But there's a doctor from Cincinnati named George Bickling who formed a group called the Knights of the Golden Circle. And the goal of Knights of the Golden Circle was to capture Indianapolis, Columbus, Ohio, or Chicago, because they all had major Confederate uh, prison camps there. And the goal was to, to capture the uh, prisoners, arm them, and then take over a, a Midwestern capital. So the Knights of the Golden Circle, I guess the best way to compare them would be to, to Masonic lodges of today. Not that Masonic lodges were traitors or anything, but the, the kind of the scope and the lodges and the secrecy and the pledges and all that kind of stuff. And they're estimated to have had 125,000 white males in the state of Indiana who belonged to the Knights of the Golden Circle. They were suppressed by Morton and by General Burnside, who was from Liberty, Indiana. And then another group formed called the Order of American Knights. They were short-lived, and then a third group formed with the same goal called the um, Sons of Liberty, 1864. And eventually, Governor Morton suppressed every group, put some of them on trial. Um, there's a famous case for any lawyers here in the room, Ex parte Milligan, if you study that in law school, where um, the publisher of the Huntington New Indiana newspaper was shut down because of, he was uh, considered to be traitorous. He was tried in a military court and sentenced. And in 1866, the Supreme Court said, sorry, as long as the civilian courts were still in operation, you cannot try a citizen in a military court. Now, that still has ramifications today because when President Obama tried to close down Guantanamo, one of the things his lawyer said, you can't look at ex parte Milligan in Indiana in 1866. So some of the things that happened in the Civil War are still resonating. Now, one of the more fun parts of the book is, and I'll, I'll let you go with this, is that um, I actually um, decided to follow the families, the Civil War families after the Civil War, because as Charlie said, there were Civil War pensions made them established by um, Benjamin Harrison. And you would get $2, $4, $6, $8 a month, and then your, your, your uh, descendants could receive that same money. Well, I follow six of the folks that fought in the Civil War. Each one is an amazing story. One of them I followed his daughter until 1965. But I'll just tell you one quick vignette. James Harvey Kimberlin, one of the 33 men that went to fight, was a member of the 124th Indiana. He was captured in uh, Spring Hill, Tennessee, as his unit was moving towards Nashville in 1864. He was taken to the Andersonville prison. I don't have to tell you how bad the Andersonville prison was. Tens of thousands of men starved to death there. And uh, after uh, April 1865, he and 459 Hoosiers were put on a train from Andersonville and sent to Jackson, Mississippi. For some reason, they got off the train there and had to walk from Jackson to Vicksburg. I still don't know that reason. But while they're just north of Vicksburg, they get on a steamboat called the Sultana. Well, anybody who knows the Sultana knows it's the worst maritime disaster in American history. They get on the boat, the boilers explode somewhere south of Memphis and 1,800 American soldiers die either from burns or, or, or drowning. James Harvey Kimberlin survived Sultan uh, the, the Andersonville prison and then the Sultana. So he moves here to Indianapolis. He becomes a, a security guard at the Soldiers and Sailors Monument for the end of the 19th century. And he's kind of a minor politician. He gets a patronage job. He gets a mailman's job on the train. So he lived out in McCordsville. And he would come down at night, the night before he had to leave on the train, and of course he liked to drink. And uh, one night, it was in 1886, he, uh, as he tells the story in his affidavit, he was at the state Republican headquarters, as he says, watching the election returns come in. Uh, sorry, he didn't have TV, so I'm not sure what that meant, watching the election returns come in. But it was at Market in Pennsylvania. He comes back to the National Hotel. He gets up sometime during the night to go to the bathroom. And back then, a lot of the windows in these buildings would start at the floor. You would raise them up from the floor. You could actually step through them. Well, he forgot that he was on the third floor. And he stepped out of the, out of the, uh, out of the uh, window to relieve himself, because he thought he was on the first floor, and fell three floors on an iron grate, broke his back and his leg and everything. And they put him on a flat car and took him out from Cordsville and kind of left him out there. Well, he survived that. <laughs> and during the course, during the course of his um, uh, applications for a Civil War pension, he kept getting turned down. And you can have affidavits that go back and forth and everything. And uh, he kept trying to tell them he was not drinking on election night of 1886. He did not have anything to drink. And it's just that he mixed up being on the first floor and the third floor. 
Well, then in 1914, he's walking in downtown Indianapolis, and he gets hit by a car. Now, how many people get hit by a car in 19, how many cars are there in 1914? <laughs> he gets hit by a car. Well, so then, he's, he keeps going through the process, and finally, he gets a letter from Senator Kern, who was a famous Indiana senator at the time, and says, guess what, your application for a Civil War pension has been approved at $8 a month. But he never gets the money. He's trying to figure it out. What's, what's going on here? Well, he's in another bar in downtown Indianapolis, and he runs into another man whose name is James H. Kimberly. And it turns out they're second cousins. And they sat there and drank long enough to figure out that the wrong guy got the pension. <laughs> so James, James H. got his pension. James Harvey never got his pension. And he died in 1924, having never got his pension. So that's one little vignette and one of the very interesting members of the Kimberlin family. I will let you go. I will tell you that uh, Jay Hine, the Sangamore Institute, have been very gracious in purchasing a copy of this book for every one of you here today, if you'd like to take one home with you. And so it's a, I tried to write it tightly. It's only like 150 pages. It's not going to take you forever. And, and hopefully you'll learn something about Indiana during the Civil War. Thanks for having me. Mike, I've got to say, I want to know what that guy was drinking. <laughs> I'd like to have some. <laughs> Newton, <clears throat> Newton Booth Tarkington, a giant of literature in the United States during the 20th century. Tarkington grew up on North Pennsylvania Street here in Indianapolis went to Shortridge High School, later to Purdue University, where he was a member of Sigmund Mackay, then to Princeton, and wrote during his career of some 76 years, 54 published novels and three produced plays. He is truly one of the giants of our literary world in the United States since our founding. He's one of only three authors to win two Pulitzer Prizes during his career for fiction. He was so prominent that Time Magazine put him on the cover and made him Man of the Year in 1924. Tarkington was an individual who believed not just in the importance of literature and writing, but in the importance of government and being a good citizen. He exhibited this by running for the legislature and winning in 1902. He served one term in the House. He later was to make many contributions to the universities and colleges that had provided the education for his career. He gave the money for Tarkington Hall, a residential facility in, on, on the Purdue campus. Tarkington is probably best known for two novels, The Magnificent Amber, Ambersons being one of them, and a, a, a second, uh, which uh, you probably are familiar with, it was called Alice Adams. Now both of those books, of course, were made into movies and the story has been enjoyed by many of us for a long period of time. Tark, as he was called at Princeton, helped found the Princeton Triangle Show. He is, in some circles, given the credit of creating or helping found the, the Indiana Society of Chicago, which many of you have been a part of. But Tarkington also was much more than that. He was a social and political critic. He was in favor of prohibition. Kind of hard to believe an author who didn't drink, but that's the story. He opposed FDR and vehemently opposed the New Deal during his uh, career. Tarkington's work, nearly everything he wrote, was set right here in Indianapolis. 
where he attended Shortridge High School. And, and I think about authors from Shortridge High School, uh, of course, uh, we, we, we've had some, but he was actually clearly the predominant one. Dan Wakefield being the most recent. But I, I, I want to suggest to you that he set his novels in central Indiana. And his commentary in those novels had to do with social conditions and environmental conditions in the state of, of Indiana. Uh, nobody had heard of an environmentalist in the year 1900, but if we had had that idea, he would have been one, that, that's for sure. He attributed the problems to the environment largely to one major innovation, the automobile. And he wrote about the foul-smelling exhaust of automobiles that he encountered on North Pennsylvania Street in Indianapolis. He disliked this so badly that he moved to the country, 4270 North Meridian Street. <laughs> <laughs> Not too far from where we sit today. Uh, that home is now occupied by Doris Ann Sadler, a former clerk of the Marion County Court, uh, and well known in local uh, circles here in Indianapolis. Now, when we talk about what he wrote about, uh, he, he was at one at the same one in the same time. He was a member of Indianapolis society, obviously from an affluent family, uh, well educated, and at the same time, he was a critic of all the things that were making Indianapolis what it was. The economic center of Indiana, and uh, the growth of the automobile industry had a lot to do with the history of Indianapolis. There are some who would suggest that had Tarkington not been so effective with his satire and criticism, that Indianapolis might be the Detroit of today. I'm not too sure whether that's a good thing or not. <laughs> but I, I would suggest to you that the novel that I enjoyed the most is not one that most people ever heard of. It's called The Gentleman from Indiana. You can't buy a copy of it now, it's out of print. James Still, the playwright in residence at the IRT, Indiana Repertory Theater here in Indianapolis, adapted that novel and it was produced as a play. This is a story of a young man who ran a newspaper in a small town outside of Indianapolis, a fictitious town. And he was a civic-minded individual, uh, an individual who uh, wanted to make a difference and ultimately ran for Congress and was elected to Congress. Now, during the time that he edited the newspaper, he was an outspoken uh, opponent of d discrimination against Catholics and Jews and African Americans. Uh, and he was, in fact, attacked by a group of men dressed in white sheets now remember, this was long before the Klan was known in Indiana. He calls them white caps in the, the, the novel. Their problem with society was not with African Americans, but with Catholics and Jews. And so th this is a story of what took place later in Indiana, in the days of D.C. Stevenson and others, but Tarkington was one of those individual novelists who maintained access to what I call the collective unconscious. He was able to tap into those things that were developing in society and ultimately would emerge as real in society. A good example was when the editor of the newspaper was injured by the white caps. Uh, a woman became editor of his newspaper. Now, in that era, that was unheard of. Women weren't supposed 
to do that sort of thing, nor were they qualified or educated properly and so forth. And, and so this, this is a, a mirror of how he saw things changing in our society. So, so when I think about Tarkington, and I think about his lifetime full of literature and awards and education, philanthropy, and his uh, ability to be a social critic, I say to myself, if there was ever a Hoosier who deserved to be a Sagamore of the Wabash, he was one. Thank you very much. Brilliant remarks, as advertised. So grateful, gentlemen. Um, the governor is testing firearms, apparently, with the 4th Indiana right now, so hopefully he'll be safe. And uh, um, But it, it affords us time for conversation, which I uh, want to take advantage of. Um, it's one of our favorite things to do, is not put speakers on a stage, um, but instead to create a round table for us to, to think together and um, also, as advertised, each of you um, have ideas and stories, and, and we need your, your best efforts. So why don't we just use the time informally? Um, the governor's going to want to share a few words when, um, when he gets here. And then a housekeeping matter is that what we're going to transition into um, for our program is a pinning ceremony for the Sagmores of the Wabash. There are some of you on this floor. Um, if you could take a few steps down, we're going to form a line. Um, so that each of you can be announced and the governor can share um, with you your pin. Um, and uh, we're going to do that in sort of an orderly fashion. Um, so as we uh, and welcome him to the podium when he's finished, if you could just um, take your place in the line, we'd appreciate it. But I'd like you to ask questions um, or share comments with each of our speakers, and they can either come to the podium or, or use that microphone. Um, we don't have time, and the logistics won't work for us to bring a microphone to you. So speak loud, please, Lynn, and um, share your name, if, if you will. I'd like to open the floor. K.P. Singh. Um, so Murphy, I'd like for you, you know, you really went through a very intricate history of families. I'd like for you to really think about how does it intersect with the citizenship of the day. And I think that some of the wonderful thoughts came out of uh, Charlie's presentation. Would you try to relate that? Oh, that sure. History it's with more time than our place. Yeah, to me, it's very clear. I Maybe mean, you could use the microphone. Next. Yeah. I think it's on. Sorry. To, to me, it's very clear. Uh, back in the Civil War, prior to the Civil War, um, Indiana was not so much anti African American as they were anti cheap labor. And the primary population of Indiana were Irish and German immigrants. And they did not want to compete with African American labor whether it was free or, or former, you know, for, always free or former slaves. What do you have today with the Latinos? We have a tremendous percentage of our population here in Indiana that does not want to have to compete with cheap Latino labor. And you have the same issues coming up again, it's just a different color skin, different last names. We have a history in this state of, of, of racism we really have to be careful about that we don't repeat. I'll give you one quick example. The, the, the Constitution of 1851 had a very controversial article called Article 13. It was considered to be so controversial that the convention decided to have Hoosiers vote on it separately because they didn't want Article 13 to drag the rest of it down. And what it did was it banned all African Americans, free or slave, from coming to the state of Indiana. And it only lost in four counties. The Article 13, and that was during the Quaker influence counties of eastern and northeastern Indiana. In Scott County, there were more votes for Article 13 than there were for the main part of the Constitution. And that stayed in effect till 1866 or 1867, can't remember the exact year. So we face the same issue today, KP, that we faced back in the 1850s and 60s. Just a different, a different ethnic group or a different race is, is taking its turn uh, as the whipping boy. Very good. Let's take another question or two. Toby. Well, uh, Dr. Toby Malachi, I can pass Article 13. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Finally, Doc, I can see you. So. Stand up here so they can see you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I only 
blush. <laughs> my, my question is that uh, Indiana has had uh, a, a long history of racism, but on the same token, though, there's been so many dedicated people, I think it's been overlooked to help people like myself, who's rich from Connorsville, Indiana, come up through and be able to succeed in this state. So uh, I just wanted to uh, your comments on that, that although it's been a tough battle, but we were able to move up, so I want to give those comments. Thank you. And, and I can I can add some comments there. It's, it's been really interesting. I've been with the Benjamin Harrison Presidential Site for the past two and a half years, and so I've been reading more deeply, of course, about that era and the president specifically. And what constantly astonishes me is how, how complicated that time period was in terms of people's personal opinions. Um, and for Benjamin Harrison, um, of course, descended from you know, he's the great grandson of the center of the Declaration of Independence, but also was, that was the governor. That <laughs> 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 his own legacy, that his own legacy representing Indiana as a candidate in 1888 was that he was advocating for um, full civil rights for African Americans, full voting rights. Um, integration in schools. We have letters where he's talking about the joy it brings to his heart to see African American children and white children walking to school together. It's very much against what you might think of that era. So to think about Indiana being represented nationally by somebody in his inaugural address who's specifically calling for this um, really speaks to how complex that topic was then, much as it is today. John. Uh, I don't have as much to offer on that subject except to say that Target, to my subject, uh, satirized and wrote a great deal about the class system in our society. Now, you might think that's pretty unusual because he was clearly a member of the educated, we might call them the elite in today's world. Uh, some, some, some people call them. And, and at any rate, the point I, I make is that he was an individual with a much bigger worldview than the people around him. He lived here in Indianapolis. He associated, went to parties, did all kinds of things with this group of people that were building automobiles and building auto parts and all this sort of thing. And at the same time, wrote an enormously effective satire about the things they were doing and why he thought it was evil. And the interesting thing about that was that he saw it in, in a variety of ways of the most unfortunate was the labor that worked in those factories. Now that was not necessarily racial labor related, although a lot of it was, because the, the black people of America were moving from the South for jobs in this part of the United States. And, and I, I was constantly amazed at uh, his insights into how people felt in their gut, which is really what he seemed to be able to, to create. I'm one of those people who believes that great writers and artists get their inspiration from their unconscious. And you as an artist, I'm sure, you may agree with me about this. What you put on paper comes from someplace sometimes you can't really know. And Tarkington believed this and was able to capture it. And I think the measure of a really great artist is the one who collects, who gets into the collective of a society. And that's why they endure. That's why they remain important even after they die. I'm very delighted and quite relieved to report that the 51st governor of the state of Indiana has survived the uh, artillery attack that we just shook our building. And our Guess who was making that noise? <laughs> Um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, John Murner, who serves as event chairman um, and organizer for today for an introduction of our governor. Thank you very much, Jay. And thank you all for your patience today. Uh, it was, uh, governor, thank you for taking the time to meet with the troops and reenactors and making some noise on Meridian Street. <laughs> we appreciate that. Uh, obviously, the governor needs no introduction, and we're very excited that he's with us today to do, for this special ceremony to recognize so many of you that have been honored with the Sagamore of the Wabash Award. I wanted to share with you a couple comments. Uh, some of you attended the vice president's um, uh, viewing of his portrait yesterday, and uh, I was able to share with him the new pen, which he thought was very cool, but he wanted me to share some comments with you. He said to all of you, how I wish I could be with you today. My thanks, and thanks to, and you have the thanks of all Hoosiers, and to all you Sagamores being pinned today. You are most certainly represent 
what it means to be great citizen leaders. Governor Daniels also was unable to make it today, uh, but President Daniels did send this greeting. As former governor, it was always a great privilege to recognize great Hoosier leaders with the Sagamore of the Wabash honor. Thanks to all of you Sagamores assembled today for your sacrifice, commitment of talent, and community spirit. So with that, I would like uh, the governor to come forward for some brief comments. Then he has a special award, and then we're going to do the pinning ceremony. And the way that's going to work is the Sagamores, we ask you to line up, and as you come up the stairs, we'll announce your name. You'll go over. The governor will uh, hand you your pen. We'll not be able to actually they pin you, which is probably for safety reasons. <laughs> you'll get a quick picture. All you have to do is turn around. We'll automatically get your picture, and then you'll proceed off so we can keep the line moving forward. So thank you so much. Governor Holcomb. It's a real honor to be um, in a collection of, of folks like I see from my perspective behind the building <coughs> gathered here today. The, obviously, the collection of achievement in this room uh, is, a, is a bit almost beyond description. And to think about um, where we've come from since the, uh, since the Sagamore of the Wabash Award was created, um, we've come a long way. And I hope that, I hope that Jay, you are able to get access, get your hands on, do some interviews with everyone that I see here that is a, is a Sagamore of the Wall Badge. You could truly have a 20 volume set of building Indiana if you would have uh, access to the diaries that I, am, that I am looking at right now. I fully appreciate uh, what it means to, to be a Sagamore of the Wall Badge. I have received one myself and I did not award it myself. <laughs> just, just for the record. Uh, but, uh, but I am in a unique position in that I understand what to, what to receive and what to give. A Sagamore is all about, and, and knowing that it started in the 40s, uh, 1940s, with Governor Gates, what a brilliant that, uh, that idea was to import to our, to our state and recognize it the best, the best among us, and obviously, um, as governor, having access to that to the wisdom and the advice and the counsel truly does make a difference on a day in and a day out basis. And so I just want to thank you all for your contributions, for your for your talents that you continue to give, um, all of you. And uh, one of us here today uh, continues to give and give and give and has for decades. And I wanted to just recognize him um, he, he has received a Sagamore of the Wabash by my, since Governor Bowman. So if you're, if you're running down the list, that's my seven predecessors. Um, and he continues to, to really um, set the standard for what it means to be a Sagamore, not just day in, day out, but decade after decade after decade. And so um, this individual uh, didn't just serve in World War II, uh, he also served in Korea, and he didn't just serve in World War II and Korea, he also served in Vietnam. And then after um, coming home um, to grow roots, he did so for the state of Indiana, did, did so for 18 years. And he answered the call from multiple governors, and as I have come to quickly uh, understand, he was the guy that would take those jobs um, that had to be done and that others might have fallen short on, but he always got the job done. And so it is really my honor, and I hope you um, join me in appreciation to recognize Don Moreau for his continued contribution to the life of the <laughs>
Dr. Moreau was not able to navigate the stairs, so. to announce your name and then the governor that presented you the Sagamore in the year you received it, even if it's multiple. Uh, please proceed across the stage, the governor give you your pen, turn for the camera, and then proceed down the hallway, please. So, help us stay clear of the camera. Oh, oh there she is. Awesome. And we're starting with Mr. Daniel Elsner. Dan, please come forward. Governor Daniels and Pence presented in 2011-2015. Terry Anchor, Governor Pence in 2015. Sarah Kesterson, Governor Kernan, 2004. <laughs> Mr. Marco Dominguez, Governor Pence, 2015. Rabbi Sandy says so. Governor Bai, 1995, Governor Pence, 2013. Rabbi Dennis says so. Governor Bai, 1995. Governor O'Bannon, Governor Bai, what year was that? 92 and 98. Mr. Leland Tanner, Governor O'Bannon, 2000. Benjamin Evans, Governor Pence, 2016.
Ms. Martha Lampkin, Governor Orr, 1987, Governor Daniels, 2007. The good Dr. Ned Lampkin, Governor Bowen, 1979. Mr. Russ Pulliam, Governor Bowen, 1979. That's good, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mr. Gene Lude, Governor Pence, 1980, and Governor Orr, 1984 and 2016. Thank you. Good, sir. Jason Callahan, Governor Pence, 2013. Did I do that? Miss <laughs> <laughs> Julia Wicker, Governor Kernan, 2004. Kevin Brenniger, Governor By, 1992. <laughs> Mr. Lonnie Cox, Governor Pence, 2016. Barbara Cox, Governor Pence, 2016. The Honorable Jared Linder, Governor Pence, 2016. Michael Hillsworth, Governor Orr, 1984. <laughs> Mr. Raju Chintala, Governor Pence, 2015. Governor 
President Benjamin, here's Mr. Charles Vaughn, Miller Events 2014. Mr. President. Please, please. Please, please. Please, please. Please, please. Miss Linda Chisholm, O'Bannon, by and for years. The Honorable Michael Gargano, Governor Pence, 2015. <laughs> John Maryland, Governor Daniels, 2005. <laughs> Dr. Angelique Walker Smith, Governor Pence, 2014. Mr. Richard Thrapp, Governor Pence, 2016. Mr. John Tor, Governor Orr, 1981. The Honorable Michael Murphy, Governor Orr, what year was that? The Honorable and esteemed James Adderholt, Governor Pence, 2016. Fitzgerald, Governor Daniels, 2008. <laughs> Mr. Michael Pitcher, Governor Kernan, 2004. Leonard, 
Governor Pence, 2015, Governor Daniels, 2007. Mr. W. Seymour Holt, Governor Bye, 1993. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Timothy Francis, Governor Daniels, and Governor Welch. This was 2008. Toby Malucci, Velikai, excuse me. Governor Bai, 90 and 96. Amen. The Honorable Henry Christian Johnson, Governor Pence, 2016. John M. Bucks, Governor of Oman and Orr, 1997. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Donald Schulte, Governor Pence, 2013. Thank you. 
Bus and the President of the Sagamore Institute, Mr. Jay Hein. Governor Pence, 2016. And Dr. John Warner. Mr. Sam Frame, personal director, bodyguard, frontman, and that was Governor Pence, 2016. Round of applause for the governor, please.